back to Sprague Homestead. I've had a lot of people asking me about our Harlequin rabbits that you see from time to time in our rabbit videos. So I'm going to do a little breed pro profile just about the Harlequin. Now Harlequin rabbits are actually a very old breed. Uh, a lot of people think that they're a newer breed because you just don't see them quite as much. Harlequins have kind of come and gone in popularity over the years. We've actually been dropped from the ARBA, the American Rabbit Breeders Association, um, standard of perfection a couple of times, simply because there weren't enough numbers of rabbits being shown. Right now, we seem to be in an uptick. We've got a lot of breeders and a lot of new breeders coming on board. Our numbers at conventions and uh, being registered with the ARBA are kind of on the uptick. So that's very good news for the breed. It is a very challenging breed, and this is kind of why we keep seeing breeders come and go. And I'll kind of go over that with you and kind of explain what makes this breed so very challenging to work with. So as I said, the Harlequin breed itself is very, very old. They were actually developed in France um, in the 1800s. They were first shown at the World's Fair in Paris in the very late 1800s, um, just before the turn of the century. Um, and then they, they were imported into the United States in the early um, part of the 1900s. So this breed has been around a long time, and it's gone through a lot of different transitions. Now, the breed itself was actually originally known as the Japanese. Um, part of this, and I'll pull out Magic Man and kind of give you an idea, but the idea behind the name Japanese was when they were posed on their side, they were to resemble kind of the, a more like a fan than a true flag. So they were supposed to, with the individual barring, kind of look like the rays of the rising sun, which is not something you hear a lot. Um, but there's a lot of Harlequin breeders that I've met that have never heard that story. I think my friend Vanessa Jordan of Gems Rabbitry for sharing that with me when I first got started. I've seen it a few other places as well. Um, but that, that was part of why they were originally called the Japanese. They only came in what we know them as today as the black Japanese, which is a black and orange rabbit, which again, I'll show you on magic here in a little bit. So that was the original um, markings for them. There were no magpie harlequins, which are um, a color and a white base, which I'll again show you those colors here in a little bit. Um, they were just in the black Japanese. Colors got added on eventually as the breed progressed. Um, in the 1940s, I believe it was, the breed was renamed to the Harlequin. And the reason for this is we were in the midst of, you know, war times and all things Japanese, which had previously been a big deal. Everybody was really into Oriental type stuff in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Um, the Japanese culture thing kind of fell out of favor because of the wartime. So the breed was actually renamed at that time to the Harlequin. Um, the orange and black version, which again was really about the only thing that was recognized, was renamed to the Japanese Harlequin. So they did go ahead and, and keep the Japanese moniker, mostly because the breed had already been known for quite some time this way. Um, now the Harlequin is considered a commercial type breed, which is the same thing as your New Zealand, your cows, your satins. So they are classified as a meat breed. They are also a marked breed, and we are the only, um, I, I, I say the only, we're one of the only marked breeds in the ARBA standard that is judged primarily on markings. Now, we have more points awarded on markings than any other breed. The other marked breeds that you get, um, mostly you're just going to find the Dutch. It's the only thing that springs to mind at the moment is your Dutch rabbit, which is a little bit smaller. Now, the Harlequin was actually developed from the Dutch. Uh, and if you, you've ever seen the little rabbits that are, you know, five, six pounds, that are black and white, uh, black on the rear, white saddle with black and white facial markings, that's a Dutch. They're, they were very, very common when I was a kid. Um, in all things, popularity kind of, you know, ebbs and flows. So you don't see as much. We see quite a few of them in the show world. Um, very popular still with 4-H kids. But they are a marked breed. They are smaller um, than what our Harlequins are today. Our Harlequins today are six and a half to nine pounds for your bucks, seven to nine and a half for your does. We have a huge weight swing for a rabbit of this size. A lot of times when you get into a rabbit that's under 10 pounds, 
you tend to have a much tighter uh, weight swing of a pound and a half to two pounds. But we have a very large weight swing. Um, part of that is because, as I said before, the markings on these guys make them so difficult to breed that uh, we don't want to exclude anybody, basically. So we have a much bigger weight range than a lot of rabbits. Um, but they were developed from the tortoiseshell Dutch, which is kind of naturally occurring um, overseas. So um, I guess that's a little bit of the background on these guys. So they, we'll go into colors next. Uh, there are two, as I said, there are two grouping um, patterns, and that is the Japanese and the magpie. And there are actually four colors in each, and we have the same exact four colors in both. So let's get started. Okay, so our first demonstrating model, <laughs> this is Serenity, Gem Serenity. She is a black Japanese. So you, what that means is that you have the orange color, and then you've got the black. So the Japanese is going to be denoted by the orange. Um, when you get into your diluted colors, your blue and your lilac, it's going to be a lighter color called a fawn. And I'll bring out Handyman and kind of show that because um, Handyman is a very good example of what a blue Japanese should be. So in your blacks and your chocolates, you're going to get a, a, a darker orange. Sometimes you'll get this light banding here. It's not a big deal. But you really want as dark of an orange as you can get, a really good orange color. And it should, it should pretty much cover the whole thing. You'll get some white around the eyes, down on the jowls, sometimes on the inner ears, and on the belly. Um, but like I said, Serenity is considered a black Japanese. Okay, and if you've watched very many of my videos, you've probably seen Handyman before. Handy is uh, my guinea pig for some videos. Um, I think he was in our feeding rabbits that don't want to eat video. I use him on occasion. Handy's an old man. He's uh, almost four years old. But you can kind of see, compared to Serenity, um, he is a blue. So he is a diluted, which means that the, um, it's kind of a genetics thing, but uh, blue is the dilute of black. Lilac is the dilute of chocolate. So anyway, he's a blue. You can kind of see, instead of black, how much, you know, kind of a steel, steel blue he is. And you can also see how much lighter... I know it's kind of hard sometimes on, on camera, but you can kind of see how much lighter his orange is as opposed to Serenity, who has the full extension color gene, which means that she's going to be more to the orange, and he's going to be classified what we call a fawn. All right, so on the other side of that, you have the magpie. So what makes the magpie different than the Japanese is simply going to be that we are white or the Japanese are orange. The colors, um, your black, your chocolate, your lilac, your blue, are going to be the exact same shades, or at least they should be. The only difference you're going to have is going to be this white instead of orange. So, we do show in two groups, the Japanese and the magpie group. Um, and like I said, there are four colors in each. So let's try, I'm going to try pulling out some babies just because they're easier to deal with on the table together. And I'm going to try to show you all four colors together so you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. <laughs> all right. So this is going to be kind of like herding cats, I do believe. But this is a representation of all four of the black, or all four of the magpie colors. So what we have, we've got black. So you can see he's black with white. We've got chocolate. We've got our blue. And then we've got a lilac. Alright, now a lot of people, um, even breeders who breed um, harlequins, have a really hard time telling between the blue and the lilac. Uh, the biggest thing is they get older, you can kind of turn them over and look for a pink eye cast to the eye. Um, it's kind of hard to see when they're very, very small like this. But in ones that have really good depth of color, it's actually not too hard to see. You can distinctly see that there is a color difference between these guys. Uh, the lilac are going to be more of a pinky cast, whereas your blues are going to be more of that steel blue-gray. So I'm not quite fortunate to have a whole bunch of Japanese litters of the same age. So we're going to kind of do this one in two parts. So like, we've already shown Serenity, but again, that's an example of a black Japanese. So we've got the orange with the black coloring. And this little beauty here is a chocolate. Um, so you've got the chocolate up against the orange. Now these guys can be kind of hard to show if you're into showing. Unless you've got a really strong orange and a really strong chocolate, the markings kind of fizzle out and disappear. Um, but that's examples of those two colors. And let me see what I've got in the way of 
blue and lilac. All right, now somebody's being a little awful, but these are some litter mates. Uh, these are blue and lilac. So this one here is going to be the lilac. Again, you're looking at that pinkier color, and this is another blue. Not the greatest marked on either one, but you can at least see the distinct color differences. Now, lilac is the hardest color to show in Harlequins, um, as far as your Japanese are concerned, because this dove gray tends to absolutely disappear in the fawn. So this animal has actually got fairly good body markings. You just really can't see them. You can kind of see the big splotch here, but the stuff back here, um, it's got a little brindling in, so it does kind of disappear. All right, so those were your basic colors in the Harlequin. Now I'll kind of, I'll, I'll use magic here to kind of go over some of the information to talk about what these guys are actually judged on. So like I said before, they were originally named for, for the Japanese rising sun. And he's being a little cantankerous because I've got some open does in the barn. But basically the gist of it, and he really doesn't want to pose, is you can kind of see you've got black, orange, black, orange, black. And when he is actually participating and wanting to do it right to where his arch is correct, he actually does look kind of like a rising sun. Now, like I said before, these guys are supposed to be a commercial type, and when he's behaving himself, he's got a much better rise than, um, than he looks like. What has been the biggest downfall in the Harlequins is because we are a marked breed, a lot of breeders um, in the earlier part of the breed in the United States got uber, uber focused on the markings. And because of that, the body type tended to suffer. So what we have a lot of, of trouble with now is Harlequins that have extremely long shoulders, um, that are very hollow in the loin, that are very pinched in the rear. And so a lot of people don't like to use them for meat rabbits because traditionally there's not a lot to them. Now in the last 20 years, from what I'm told from a lot of breeders, it has gotten remarkably better. I have been breeding Harlequins for about five years now, and I can tell you in the five years I've had them, the type has come up huge. Uh, confirmation overall, we're seeing nicer, larger animals um, with more solid loin, um, with nice, bigger, rounder behinds, which is what you want in a meat rabbit, and just all over better dimensions. Now, you would think because the type is getting better that the markings would be getting worse, but this isn't the case either. What you've got is a good, solid base of breeders in most of the United States now that have really worked on doing both. Um, in our barn, we look for markings first, sure. I mean, that's kind of what the breed is for. But we also pair that up with a nice body. And if I'm getting a lot of body flaws, I don't care how nice the markings are, they got to go. Um, some other breeders will buy them, so I'll sell them. If, you know, full disclaimer, I'm not happy with the body type. Some people don't mind. Um, but that's kind of, you know, that's kind of where the breed is at. Now, what these guys are actually scored on as far as Arba standard <laughs> gets a little complicated. We actually have 60 points out of 100 allotted just for markings. Um, now, he's not by any stretch a perfect animal. He's got some flaws. We've got a very blank one side. And his ears are actually almost the same color now. But probably the biggest distinctive thing that a Harlequin is known for is this right here, the split face. Now his is a little offside. Um, I do have a couple I'll show you in a minute that are darn near perfect. But what the Harlequin is actually scored for is, is you want a face that's divided, mostly black on one side, mostly orange on the other, or whatever the color pattern may be. Um, so if you're dealing with a magpie, this side would be white. If you're dealing with a blue Japanese, this side would be blue, etc. So what we're supposed to have is an alternating face and alternating ears. Now you can kind of see, and the camera picks it up pretty well actually, that these ears are slightly color different. Now when he first started showing this ear did not have as much brindling, it was more distinctly orange. But this is what we're supposed to have, is the alternation. So you're supposed to be alternating from here to here and here to here. So it kind of cross goes. And that's not all. So they are also supposed to have an alternating chest, which he does. Now his, and I'm moving it with my finger, <laughs> they should have a very distinctly, um, you know, very distinct mark down the side or down the middle of the chest, which this leg needs to be black to this side's face being black. So what you have is what's called a three-part frontal, meaning the left ear, the right face, and the left chest will be the same color the right ear, the left face, and the right side of the chest will be the same color. 
so he's got that going for him. Now, like I said, he is getting a little muddy. He's, he's getting to be an older boy, and you do get a lot of color bleed. Now, on the sides, now on the side, you are supposed to have five to seven alterations. So we go one, two, three, four, five, and sometimes you can almost count a little orange down here. These little goofy half bars, you can kind of see where he's got an extra one coming in. Some judges count them, some, some don't. Um, I mark it down as, a, you know, not great clarity because it's kind of screwing up his, his body line. Now what we want is crisp, clean lines. Uh, they tend to do that a lot more when they're younger and kind of, they kind of get a little bled through as they get older. So, um, this guy has shown, oh, for the last year, he just turned a year old. And he was a grand champion uh, right about the first time he showed as a six-month-old. So, um, he's he's beat show he's won in shows where he was uh, one of 52 is his greatest accomplishment. So uh, he did retire this this fall. He's not really enjoying the shows as much. Um, some rabbits like all animals. Some rabbits. Um, you can take them and you can tell they really dig being there. They, they like getting out, they flaunt their stuff, they pose pretty, they do everything the judge asks for. And when they reach the end of their show career, you can kind of tell because they just don't want to anymore. They fight the judge, they don't want to come out, they thump a lot, uh, they don't eat at the show as well, which causes condition problems. So, um, he is retired. He will live here for the rest of his life unless my friend Vanessa gets her barn together and then I might actually send him on down the road but right now he's just making babies he is not a rabbit that will ever go to freezer camp this this guy will if he doesn't stay here he'll, like I said he'll end up at my girlfriend's house making more babies and so be on the mo body markings and like I said he's not a, a real good example because his feet don't alternate like they should but beyond that the goal is to have all feet, four feet actually alternate in square. So where we have this one is black and this one is orange, that would mean that this foot behind the black foot would need to be orange. And it's, we've gotten partial credit because you can see that very distinct orange band on top of it. This one being behind the orange foot should be mostly black. It is mostly black. Um, the alternating feet I'm finding is one of the harder things to get. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I could go into all the nuances of the actual scoring, but for this purpose, I think that's all we need. Okay, and then talking about that face split, I was saying that you can get them where they're darn near perfect down the middle. Now, this is uh, one of Melantho, who is another one of my bucks. This is one of his kids, and you can see that that face split is darn near perfect all the way down the middle. It skews towards the top here just a little bit. This is the ideal. This is what we strive for. Um, they don't always stay. I get them sometimes as a baby and as they get older they start what we call in the in the breed bleeding across um, where they kind of start to move one side or the other. But as of right now this guy's got a perfect face split. So that's kind of the highs and lows and some beginning information about the Harlequins. Um, I do get a lot of people who ask why we are breeding such a fancy breed um, when we really just started out for meat on the homestead and I guess my answer to that is a couple of different things um for in terms of personality these guys cannot be beat the harlequins are the easiest rabbits to deal with of all the breeds that I've had um they produce a lot of meat because we're a meat marked breed that means 95 percent of these guys do not make show standard uh, my number gets better every year um but they just don't because it's a very specific marking pattern um a lot of them just don't pass muster I, you probably saw in that snippet where i did with the um the blue and the lilac japanese if you've noticed one of them had a white paw that's a dq which means that rabbit cannot be bred it cannot be shown it's destined for either freezer camp or to be a pet um so because of that they're a good meat breed just because so many of them end up needing to be called out um but like I said, they're, they're super, super sweet and easy to deal with. Um, even the bucks, they, they're not big sprayers, which in my New Zealand's, they were horrific sprayers. Um, my champagnes have been sprayers too, but the Harlequins tend not to spray. I mean, you can see Lane here is a, uh, what are you, buddy? Three-year-old. He's a three-year-old magpie buck. 
you can see how white he is, indicating that he doesn't spray. He doesn't like pee on him. Um, the Japanese are no different. I think out of all the bucks I've got, I've got one who sprays. So they're a cleaner breed. You know, I don't really like dealing with a lot of bucks that spray. It's just not really my cup of tea. Um, but they're super easy going, super sweet, super easy to, to handle. Uh, you don't get a lot of biting, slapping, clawing, any of that other malarkey that you get out of some of the other breeds. Those are excellent mothers. They'll foster other babies very easily, but they don't fight you to see the babies. They don't give you a lot of hard times, um, and I really like that. What Canaan likes about them is the color. Uh, in other breeds that we've had, of course, everything looks the same. And he is not big on that. He doesn't spend a lot of time in the rabbit barn. So when he comes out, he wants to be able to look at him and say, I know who that is. So with the Harlequins being very distinct, even if you get similarity in pattern, there's always going to be something that's not quite the same. Uh, so you can kind of tell them apart, which makes it fun and easy for him. So when I'm out of town, if somebody's having a problem, he can say, hey, I know it's Olive because Olive looks different than the other, than the other rabbits. Now, for somebody that's going to home tan and do crafts, these guys would actually be really cool. This is another reason that I got these guys originally. I bought a Harlequin buck and was breeding it into my um, my meat butt herd, trying to get really cool looking pelts. Because at the time I thought I was going to have time, somewhere I thought I was going to have time, to actually tan hides. Now, if you've watched us for very long, you know that... We have 100 acres, we're very busy, I breed lots of different stuff, goats, uh, poultry, I show competitively, so I don't have time to do hides. Um, but if you were going to home tan and do some hide stuff, this would be a really cool breed because every hide is a different. This is also the reason that a lot of commercial breeders don't do Harlequins for hides because they want a certain consistency that you can't get out of these guys. But, if, like I said, if you're going to do home crafts, these guys would be really cool. Um, I saw somebody a couple of years ago at a horse backpacking deal that had some stuff made out of rabbit hide. And I asked them about it at the time because they looked like Harlequin Mark. They were just mutts, but they obviously had the Harlequin gene that causes them to do this. But really cool stuff. I mean, you can do all kinds of really neat stuff. Um, you can get the big blocky markings, you can get thin little tiger stripes, which isn't what we shoot for in the show world, but could make some really cool stuff. Okay, so that's kind of your overview on the Harlequin Rabbits. I hope you learned a little something about it. These guys are something I'm very, very passionate about. I'm involved in both the um, National Club for Harlequins and a regional club. I'm the Secretary of Northerquins, which is our Pacific Northwest Club here, um, and I'm a director on the National Club at this time. So. I'm really big into these guys. I show these guys every single time I go out. We are lucky enough to have won a national um, show, ARBA convention in 2016. Melantho, who we call Lane here at home, was actually the best of breed winner out of 60, 70 rabbits. So um, it's a big deal. We really love these guys. We do have a pretty big herd. We do both, um, as you've seen, we do both Japanese and magpies. A lot of breeders focus on one or the other, but we do both. Our herd runs about 45 breeding animals at any given time, and then I've got anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen on my show string. So, um, always lots of harlequins running around here. Really cool rabbits. And um, if I miss something that you have a question about, feel free to go ahead and post it down in the comments, and I will be sure to get back to you. You can also check out the website for the American, American Harlequin Rabbit Club. And... Uh, there's some history on the Harlequins there. There's some other breeder information if you're looking for a breeder near you. Um, I would encourage everybody to have one, but I'm a little biased. So that's it today from Sprague River Homestead. We will see you next time. Happy rabbit raising and happy homesteading.